Bueno, pues buenos días y bienvenidos al seminario de hoy. Eh, hoy tenemos el gusto de tener con nosotros a Juan José García Ripoll, que es del Instituto de Física Fundamental aquí al lado. Creo que es una buena oportunidad eh, para todos para conocer las cosas que se hacen en los institutos cercanos, que no siempre es el caso y te agradecemos mucho que estés aquí. Él es investigador eh, científico en el Instituto de Física Fundamental y trabaja en el Grupo de Información Cuántica y Fundamentos de Teoría Cuántica. Es doctor en Física eh, por la Universidad Complutense del año 2001 y después estuvo, después de defender la tesis, estuvo en Innsbruck durante una temporada y después en el Max Planck de Quantum Optics por cinco años, ¿no? Mm. Bueno, es largo. En el 2006 se incorporó a la Complutense como Ramón y Cajal y en el 2008 eh, sacó la plaza de científico titular aquí en el CSIC, donde promocionó a investigador científico en el 2017. Eh, su trabajo pues, eh, se centra en la investigación de tecnologías cuánticas desde aspectos más teóricos a otros más de, de relacionados con el desarrollo y la modelización de dispositivos en computación cuántica. Eh, tiene bueno, multitud de trabajos científicos, más de 6.000 citas, un, un índice H que lo he mirado hoy, según la Web of Science de 39, está también muy involucrado en labores de divulgación, que siempre es eh, importante transmitir eh, la, la ciencia a la sociedad. Y bueno, pues lo dicho, te agradecemos mucho que estés hoy aquí y ya pues cuando quieras. Gracias por esa bonita presentación y, y también por la, la oportunidad de participar en este ciclo de seminarios. Como ha dicho usted, es un, una buena oportunidad para conocernos un poco. Eh, si nos importa voy a cambiar a inglés también por visitantes y porque en principio esto se va a retransmitir y es un poquito más útil de esa forma. So when I was uh, 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 given the opportunity to give this seminar, uh, I thought about topics that we, I could talk about. I could do a, a very generic introduction to quantum computation, but I thought that that's a little bit not so useful as providing you with some insight on other research lines that are not so uh, shiny but are interesting and about the, the possibility of finding many topics of research in quantum computing that are very low hanging fruits, uh, but are nevertheless uh, have potential applications in our, in our scientific life and also outside of academia. And so I'm going to talk about quantum and, and quantum numerical algorithms so, um, for doing numeric analysis. Uh, in general, well, understood as simply solving mathematical problems. No? And well, the, the thing is that I've been working for more than 20 years on uh, uh, quantum hardware. Uh, I was lucky to start the thesis in a time in which uh, there has been an experimental revolution in the manipulation of uh, individual quantum systems. You find experiments uh, that could trap individual ions or collective ions and manipulate the quantum state, create uh, large ensembles of uh, particles in a thing common wave function, as opposed to Einstein condensate. And more recently, this revolution has moved into the solid state uh, domain with uh, the appearance of supercrunching circuits or the control of, of quantum dots and other um, impurities in, in quantum material. And so there is a, a, an explosion of opportunities to do new things with uh, materials that were well known and also to create new devices using these technologies. One of the most uh, or, or best uh, advertised uh, possibilities is the use of uh, or the creation of quantum computers. This is a, a, a pi canonical picture of a quantum computer made of supercrunching circuits. Uh, it's very, I like it very much because it's one, one of the last pictures that you can see of uh, this type of devices. People are no longer putting pictures of the devices anymore. Everything is secret. But you can see here uh, very clearly some supercrunching qubits talking to each other, interacting capacitively, and talking to some resonators that we can use to control these qubits in a very uh, uh, accurate way. So this is a prototype of uh, nine qubits. I think it was the largest that was uh, allowed to be built uh, using public funding in the United States. And, and this was made in a group of uh, John Martinis in, in Santa Barbara and Google. Uh, and so we have these devices, and these devices, uh, they give us a, a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, controlling quantum systems in a different way, in a more systematic way than just uh, shining light on, on quantum systems and so on. What we have is uh, we have a quantum register with uh, uh, individual quantum systems that have a very simple Hilbert space, uh, zero or one, two states, essentially but which nevertheless give us, when they are together, they give us a very large uh, space of possibilities of amplitudes uh, or states that they can uh, have, and the possibility of making superpositions of all those possible states. And the way we make those superpositions is by combining elementary operations through the, through the control of, of individual qubits and through the interactions between uh, these two qubits, pairwise interactions. We have a toolbox of unitary operations, which are very simple, 
uh, they are not as big as the potentially large matrices that we could make. They, they are typically two by two or four by four matrices that we engineer in the lab. But when combined together, we can really approximate any unitary that we want. So any transformation of a quantum system can be built in the lab by combination of unitary elementary unitary operations. And then we have the possibility of making very sophisticated measurements and uh, study expectation values of arbitrarily complex emission operators. So it's a toolbox for uh, uh, manipulating quantum systems in a very systematized way, uh, as, as described by quantum information theory and also the developments at the in quantum computation there. there. Uh, so this is very nice. So essentially, if you think about algorithms, they can be grouped in like two big families. Uh, one of uh, the big families is uh, worries about creating wave functions. So what states I can create in the lab and how these states solve a particular problems. You want to solve an optimization problem, but you have to want to find the, the, the wave functions of some states that solve a particular constraints or minimization function or, or, or things like that. Uh, in, in our case, we will be worrying about making functions <coughs> that solve mathematical problems such as uh, partial differential equations or other complicated uh, problems. There, is, uh, other, there are other families of algorithms which that worry not so much about creating the states, but once you have them, how do you interrogate it? How do you know what states you have and what are the properties? So computing expectation values uh, with a minimal number of measurements and, and doing things in the end, because measurements is always the last stage of an algorithm, uh, um, doing things more effect efficiently than classically. So this is also very important, but I'm not going to be talking about it today. So um, there is a boom of technology. There is an exponential explosion on the capacity of these quantum computers. So it's everything solved. So we have a very optimistic uh, uh, trend with just four points dictated by, by, by IBM. But is, is this uh, everything? I mean, we have many algorithms. But is there anything that we can do in this context where we are not uh, completely experts in quantum computations? Is it something that we can gain from the field or we can contribute to? And th th there is indeed many possibilities to contribute to the field of quantum computation. It's not a closed research field. There are simple things like uh, you can, we can still improve the hardware. So the, har the research in hardware has been frozen for the last few years. So, so we, can, we can improve the hardware design in new qubits, still open topic, or speeding the operations that we do with them. So improving the controls that we do of these quantum systems. Again, this is not part of this talk, but this is something that we are doing here in the campus. We can also develop more complex operations. I've told you that um, we, we can do uh, arbitrary unitaries with this toolbox that we have here, but there is a cost involved in that. Uh, it's one of the things I'm going to talk about. And the other thing is that we, c we can develop uh, algorithms for solving particular problems, and there are many problems that don't have yet an algorithm for a quantum computer. And once we know those algorithms, we can even take those solutions and port them back to our classical world. So we can learn from the quantum solutions and develop new algorithms that work in a classical computer. And that's the other part of this talk I, I'm going to talk about. So regarding the first topic, so we have, uh, as I told you, a framework for quantum computation that tells us that we can do very complicated uh, calculations. Essentially, assume that you have some qubits that have some input, some information, and we want to process this information and store it in a different qubit. So essentially, with this uh, typical circuit notation, we would have a complex unitary that changes the state of this qubit based on the input of this other qubit. And quantum uh, information theory and quantum computation tells us that there is a the composition of, the, of this operation in these toolbox, and, and well, typically it's going to be efficient for many problems. But efficiency for a uh, uh, um, complexity uh, 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 theory uh, scientist is, is something that is an asymptotic concept. So in practice, when you take these algorithms and you decompose it into uh, uh, operations that take place in the lab, there are overheads. They are not exponential overheads. They can be algebraically uh, large. But nevertheless, we have to bring new qubits, which is called uh, auxiliary qubits or ancillas. And we need to add also more operations to actually implement what we want. So we want to decompose the, the, this complex operation into elementary tasks that we know how to do in the lab. So there is an overhead in there. And, and this overhead, which may be algebraically uh, uh, small, in practice is exponentially bad because uh, we still don't have perfect quantum computers. And if each operation we make in the lab into this is a small error, they accumulate exponentially fast, and so this this overhead may be prohibitively, prohibitively large or, or bad for actual experiments. So one research line that we are carrying now in, in our uh, quantum information group here in, in Institute of Fundamental Physics is to find out how to implement complex operations directly in the quantum processor. So by changing either the architecture of the hardware or changing how we control it. Our inspiration in this uh, um, world is, comes from a field of uh, 
artificial intelligence and, and neural networks and things that are very uh, hyped no nowadays, but which have a very ma solid mathematical foundation. So if you think about the way our neurons process information, what they do, they are simply nonlinear processors that take input from a number of, uh, of synapses, and, and they collect these inputs with some weight, and they have a nonlinear response based on the combination of these signals. And it has been known uh, uh, from the uh, uh, realms of uh, bi biology and mathematics that if you have a su sufficiently sophisticated response here, this response can be universal. You can compose many of these neurons and you can do very sophisticated computations in our head, like pattern matching, recognition, and even sophisticated calculations by just a simple ele elementary paradigm. So what we want to do is we want to take this idea and bring it into the quantum world. And this is one uh, um, way of approaching calculation. So we want to have our input qubits, I showed you before, and we want to record uh, the output of a calculation of these qubits into another uh, qubit that is going to be our neuron or quantum perceptron. And the way we do it is we excite, the, the we flip the state of these qubits from zero to one with a probability where p is the function we want to compute. Um, and well, we don't have many functions available in the lab, but one which is very feasible is this uh, sigmoid response function that goes from a from zero to one in a nonlinear fashion, very similar to a response of a, a, a discrete neuron or other models in machine learning. And we want to implement it in the uh, amplitude of probability of the, of the quantum state. So this idea we have uh, studied with uh, uh, Eric Torrontegui and myself, and the, the inspiration for that this is possible comes from quantum optics, <coughs> and from a very simple problem, which is uh, a two-level system subject to two magnetic fields. Uh, longitudinal field and a transverse magnetic field. So the, the, the transverse magnetic field, what it does is it wants to create superpositions between zero and one. So this is the sigma S control that you have here. While the V set can favor the uh, up or down states of a two level system, the zero or the one. When you solve for the eigenstates of these two by two matrix, this uh, uh, spin uh, as a function of V uh, set for a fixed Vx, what you see is that the, 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 the ground state has a probability of being in the up state, on the one state, that is a nonlinear function <coughs> of this magnetic field, B set. So apologies, I think I'm getting a call, so my voice is fluctuating a little bit. And this, this nonlinear function has a, a sigmoid response uh, uh, nature that is, is very useful, but right now it's a static. So how do I bring this into an actual computation? How do I make this a dynamical response from my system uh, as a function of qubits? So not just a magnetic field, but qubits, the other inputs of my quantum computer. Uh, what we found is that this, uh, this can be done using uh, uh, essentially uh, landau sinner theory. What, what we can do is we can, uh, if in a way, we, if we can encode here the state of our qubits and we can make this uh, uh, field initially very small, we can prepare very accurately the state of the transverse magnetic field, and then we can increase this set so that our system adiabatically converges to the nonlinear response that we want to have. So essentially we take this model and we replace the magnetic field by an interaction with other qubits, which will be done in a hardware uh, facilitated way. And we are going to in increase this interaction starting from zero to a finite value. And as we, as we do that, uh, the system will uh, accommodate a, a response. Uh, the, the, the output state is going to be exactly the response that we want to do. This is my type signal that uh, I showed you before. And this is a very robust and very uh, powerful way of, of doing computations that it is not fitting into the hardware picture that I showed you before, but it can be done, for instance, with different physical systems such as trapped ions or, or, or machines like the D-Wave uh, quantum optimizer where you have qubits that have long range interactions between, between each other. And so this is a, 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 a um, I'm going to skip the how uh, accurate it works. It's a scalable way of making computations in a quantum computer with unitary operations that are no longer just combinations of this simple two qubit or single qubit case I showed before. And it's universal. So if I, if I have some input state and I have some intermediate neurons, I can subject these neurons and the output neuron to this process. And with this two layer system, I can compute any function I want. So I just simply need to control uh, how these neurons respond to the input and how these output neuron responds to the intermediate neurons by controlling the weight and the phases of our interactions. And the output of this uh, computation, this, this output neuron, is going to implement any response function that you want. And the way of thinking about it qualitatively is very simple. Each of these neurons uh, implements a kind of uh, pixelized response. It's like one of step, uh, step type function. 
And when you combine the output of many neurons, essentially what you're doing is you're approximating any function in a discrete way. Uh, and this is essentially, uh, I mean, the way it works for the quantum system is uh, it's essentially identical to the way it works right now in, uh, in uh, ordinary machine learning. If you look at how neural networks uh, behave, essentially they are creating these uh, response functions classically uh, in, the, in the computer using uh, ordinary hardware. And they're using the same uh, type of uh, nonlinear excitations I showed you before, uh, concatenating one after another. If, if you have many layers of these neurons, you can have uh, sophisticated machines that can recognize images and, and, and give a, a solution to different calculations, or they can play games, or they can do many sophisticated things. The difference here is that we are doing this with a quantum system. So now our, our neurons are quantum mechanical. They can accept as inputs quantum mechanical states, and they process the state through superposition. So they can produce more sophisticated outputs than the calculations that a classical neural network can do. Moreover, we are now investigating how this can, apply, can be applied to other uh, 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 fields of quantum technologies. So what I show you is this, uh, just a, a kind of a artificial neuron that implements a nonlinear response based on some other inputs. Now, you can forget about quantum computation and bring this parallel into the world of quantum sensing. I can, for instance, have a, a crystal where I have uh, MB centers of impurities that can sense uh, uh, some external field. It can be an electric or a magnetic field. Now, this, these impurities, they will react to this field, activating themselves and creating a collective quantum state that is going to be, is going to be carrying information about the source, about the field, about many things. Now, how can I extract information about those sensors? I could measure those sensors and try to do a classical pro post-processing, or I could simply take another uh, of these impurities and make it interact with the others through this process I, I mentioned before, and make the response of this uh, final sensor a nonlinear function of the input of this uh, system. So I can do a better sensor that does a quantum mechanical processing of the signal of an array of quantum sensors. And this can, we are now working on how this works, and th there are indications that essentially this is a, a different way of achieving uh, the uh, quantum standard limit and having very accurate uh, quantum cameras using this very simple approach. But uh, so what I've shown you so far is ways where a computation is essentially uh, taking input from some bits in your quantum computer and moving information to some other qubits in your quantum computer. Uh, but that's uh, a bit of a cumbersome if you want to solve very sophisticated problems. So I, come from, I did my thesis in a, in a uh, different field. I come from a, the field of applied mathematics, uh, uh, working in um, linear optics and also uh, quantum mechanics, was asked in condensations. And I've been working for a long time in solving partial differential equations. And now if, if you tell me, can a quantum computer solve these uh, problems? Well, it's, uh, it's an open problem still. So can how to do sophisticated calculations that is just not a function applied to some input but really solve an equation is still uh, an open uh, task. Uh, if you look at how these uh, equations are solved classically, we have a lot of methods and they are very accurate and they can solve many different uh, 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 versions of the same problem. You have finite differences, you have spectral methods where you expand your solution in a basis and rewrite your uh, differential equation in, in, as an algebraic problem. You can use uh, neural networks as variational answers for the problems and trying to optimize the network so that it solves some partial differential equations. Or you can use finite uh, element methods that, as, as people are, are using in engineering and medicine. In the quantum computation uh, world, these seems are very like a natural approach to work with spectral methods, finite differences, because they give rise to algebraic equations, and they somehow seem to connect to our view of, uh, of nature as, as uh, uh, equations with operators and so on. Nevertheless, right now, computa quantum computation is not focused on this type of problems. If you look at what people are doing, they're mostly focused on optimization of discrete problems, uh, like uh, uh, logistics, or, or in the case of quantum chemistry, they, they, they bring a very complicated problem into a discrete nature, and they simply want to find out the, the locations of electrons in different orbitals. So there is still uh, the need to find new algorithms. Fortunately, there is an open path for this, and it's uh, it was discovered very early on, and it's now catching in a different uh, chin up in a different field. For instance, it's motivated, it's motivated by the the, the, uh, the development of algorithms to de stimulate uh, finance pro uh, finance uh, systems. They are stochastic. They they, they are described by probability uh, distributions. Uh, 
which then solves follow some differential equations, stochastic or differential equations, depending on how you want to, to formulate it. Essentially, what people are doing, they are going to uh, take a probability distribution describing a number of uh, assets. It's a very complicated function, P of S. And they're going to encode it in a quantum register. And now people are worried mostly about extracting information about this probability distribution. But the process of constructing the function itself, knowing what P is, is itself interesting. So uh, there were uh, very early works uh, um, connecting uh, quantum computers to the representation of functions. The one of them is by Gruber and Rudolph. They said, OK, we have a quantum register, which is simply an integer representation in a quantum computer with bits. How can I store a function in it? And a very natural way to do it is to take the function you want to encode and encode it as a probability distribution in the quantum register. So you have a function p of x. You can encode it as the amplitude p of x. But what is x? x would be a continuous coordinate. Now we have to discretize it because our quantum computer is discrete. So what we do is we do a, um, a uniform uh, discretization of uh, interval where our function is defined. And each position is, la is labeled by a different integer, which is encoded as uh, bits of our quantum register. So it's a, it's a very natural uh, representation. <coughs> and then what, what the computer is doing is uh, it's encoding position of a fake quantum particle using the bits of the quantum computer. And the probability uh, is just uh, a representation amplitude of probability in the quantum computer. What we have been wondering now is uh, how efficient this construct is. So the, the recipe for building this, this function is uh, inductive. Essentially, it tells you if you have an approximation of this function using two qubits or n qubits, I can tell you how to build an approximation of this function using n plus one qubits. Uh, the way it's done is uh, that we started with a discretization. For instance, if I have two qubits, I have a discretization with four points. And I have distributed my probability into bars according to each interval, which is covered by this uh, discretization. Now, if I want to add one more bit of information, I'm going to refine this representation, making it thinner. So I'm going to have a more detailed uh, uh, shape of my function, better approximation, where each uh, 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 bar splits into two intervals that are related and are separated by the new bit I have introduced. So I'm simply distributing probability into two uh, uh, states labeled by this, uh, by this bit. And what uh, people have shown is that this is a unitary representation because it conserves one quantity, which is the probability. So there is a, a unitary transformation with angles that tell you how to divide this and go to finer and finer discretizations of the function. But the problem is that when you look at uh, the angles that all these bars require, they are all different in principle. And the complete unitary to refine this uh, representation can be arbitrarily complicated. So there exists a way of building these functions in a quantum computer, but it's potentially very uh, difficult. So if it's very difficult, then when you go to the algorithms where people are using these representations, for instance, when people are doing uh, finance, uh, they, they want to take these probability distributions. They want to extract expectation values. They, they're in the end combining these approximations with Fourier transforms and phase estimation and other algorithms. So the, the complexity can grow exponentially, and it can be really unfeasible to use those representations in, the, in actual applications. So uh, understanding how functions are represented in a quantum computer is, uh, is an interesting problem. And we need to understand it better. So how, how do I characterize wo what these unitaries are or whether they are constructible at all? I'm going to become a little bit technical here. So the way we analyze quantum states, one of the many ways we have it is to do a study of entanglements, to study correlations. So if you have a quantum state in a, in a quantum computer involving eight uh, bits, for instance, I can analyze how the first four bits are correlated to the other four bits. The more correlations there are, the more complicated it's going to be to create this function in a quantum computer. And what we do is we simply split the wave function in a, a complete basis of states of one half and the other half. And we have some weights here, which are the Schmidt, Schmidt numbers, which are decay. They start very large, and they become smaller and smaller. And when we have many numbers that tell us that there's a very compl complex wave function, and it's very few numbers that tell us it's a very simple wave function. And the distribution of this number is measured by the phenomenon entropy. It's simply this, this uh, sum of logarithms of, of, of numbers. 
So the entanglement essentially is a way of understanding how complicated, how correlated the wave function that I, I, I can create in, in the lab is. So what we did in the last year is to study how um, the functions we want to represent in, uh, in a quantum computer involve more or less entanglement. We have taken uh, some uh, probability distributions that appear in many problems in, in, in physics and, and finance and in other realms, and we have analyzed uh, what happens when we encode these functions in a quantum register. Here is a one-dimensional problem. So this is a, uh, thing. This is a Gaussian, this is a Lorentzian distribution. And I, I can study the, the amount of entanglement that I have between the first and the second qubit, the first two qubits and the third one, the three qubits and the fourth one, and so on and so on. So every new qubit I add, requires a little bit of entanglement. And what we see is that the amount of entanglement I need to make that approximation more and more refined uh, decays exponentially with the number of qubits I have already in my quantum register. So if I go from six to eight qubits, I have a very little amount of entanglement to add to the quantum register. So that means that uh, almost all the complexity in, the, in describing this function or constructing them in the quantum computer happens at the long scales, at the large shape of, uh, of our functions. And only when we want to refine it, we need to add a little bit more of complexity along the way. But it's not too large. So this seems it's uh, physically doable, and I will try to argue later that, that indeed it is. The nice thing is uh, we, there is an intuition for why this happens. So uh, I told you before that when, when I add one more qubit, I split the probability into two. But if you think about the way I do it, is uh, I'm dividing intervals into half intervals. And essentially, the probabilities of these new intervals, they appear in a way that is very approximately an interpolation of the previous probability. And that, that approximation is uh, all the better when I have already uh, a fine grain of uh, discretization. So adding more bits to a discretization that is already fine uh, doesn't require a lot of information. It's like a nearest neighbor problem. So it's simply a bit, the new bit has to uh, learn information about the previous bit in a, in a near, near neighbor's interaction. So that's the reason why we have this uh, small amount of entanglement. Um, but uh, this is in 1D. So what happens in, in more dimensions? What happens if I want to represent probabilities that are skewed, distorted, and so on? I can still use these tools. I can still discretize the higher dimensional spaces. But now I have an uncertainty of high order, high order the bits. I have two integers labeling the two coordinates. And I have many bits that I can arrange in my quantum computer in different ways. And it turns out that, that the way we arrange the bits matters a lot. So if we have, if, if we have a, an arrangement where I put first all the, all the bits from one coordinate and then all the bits from the other coordinate, the amount of entanglement that I, I require in my system diverges when my system, for instance, is very squeezed, very elongated, or, or very distorted. But if I switch the order, I simply order the bits by length scales. I put uh, first the, the bits that have uh, largest distances, and as I add more bits with a finer discretization, I put them at the end, then suddenly the amount of entanglement remains bounded. So it's in this case, it's two ebits. In, in, in the previous problem, in, in one dimension, it was one ebit of entanglement. In two dimensions, it's now two ebits. And, and this is true even if I have very distorted wave functions. The way we understand it is that simply when, when I have a lot of entanglement, what happens is that the, the f in, the, in the representation where I order the, the bits by coordinate, I have first all the bits one coordinate and then the bits from the other coordinate, the first bit, the first length scale, uh, this one, is very much correlated with this length scale. But it has to go all, thr all through the other bits to carry that information to the other bits. If I put bits close together, if I order the bits of my discretization by lengths, that correlation happens as a nearest neighbor uh, process, and it remains bounded, essentially. And this happens in higher dimensions. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that is very resembling a little bit uh, normalization theory. Essentially, I, I have information on some length scales. And as I add uh, finer and finer length scales of my problem, the information I need to add, again, decreases. Um, we studied this also in three dimensions, and, and, and again, now three dimensions, three ebits for representing a, a distorted Gaussian. And it seems to be a very robust uh, way of doing um, things with a quantum computer. So what's the message from this? The message is that we have, if we want to create uh, smooth differentiable functions with fine bandwidth, um, which are not too complex, and we want to encode it in a quantum computer, 
we don't require a lot of entanglement. So the entanglement we, we require decreases with the precision we want to achieve. Um, now, this is a very uh, powerful message because it means if you are lucky and the functions you want to represent uh, have like one, two, or three habits of entanglement, you don't even need to use a quantum computer. Th those wave functions, they have a very efficient representation in a classical computer using something that is called tensor network theory. Essentially, you take a, a very complicated function that has an exponential number of states, and you decompose it as a composition of tensors where the, the tensors have three legs, and the size of these legs are related to the amount of entanglement that you are have in the process. And so there exist representations of those states that are very efficient if you don't have a lot of entanglement. So in that case, you could do a quantum computation using uh, this representation instead of using a quantum computer. Uh, um, well, that's how we did the simulations, actually. Then the other thing is that if this is true, Though that representation also tells you how to create the states in a quantum computer. There is a work by Nacho Sirac uh, and co-workers that shows that if you have this composition in tensor, uh, actually these tensors, uh, they are isometries, and they tell you that you can create these states by taking some ancillary qubits, adding one qubit, entangling them through this operation, and going on. Every time you add one more qubit, you add another isometry, and so on and so forth. So in a, in a way that we, do, we are no longer have an uncertainty on how to create these states, we have a recipe of how to create them in the lab from this decomposition in tensor. So this very simple study uh, opens us the, the possibility to do um, what we call a quantum numerical analysis, which is uh, solve mathematical problems, sophisticated mathematical problems in a quantum computer using quantum operations. Or more precisely, if your problem is uh, uh, simple, you can do the quantum algorithms in a tensor network representation with the similar algorithms that you would do in a quantum computer. So it's up to you which one to use and up to the problem that you are, you have. But essentially we have, as I told you before, we have an approach of, uh, of representing functions with quantum register. We have algorithms to manipulate those functions and we have learned that those algorithms can sometimes be done in a quantum computer or sometimes in a classical computer. So in the last uh, few minutes of this talk, um, I want to illustrate a little bit what algorithms are amenable to this paradigm. Uh, what I show you here about solving mathematical problems in a quantum computer is, is not new. There are people who have been doing this in the, in the past decades. There are uh, papers that aim to solve equations like Poisson equation um, in a quantum computer. The way this is done typically is uh, through something that's called uh, um, size estimation and also the, the inversion of a matrices, HHL algorithm, uh, either in discrete uh, um, regular lattices or also in the context of finite elements. This is a complicated approach because you have to build very big matrices and you have to encode it in the quantum computer. And then you still have to do algorithms that are um, involve a lot of operations, uh, f um, uh, in particular for the inversion, that require uh, fault-tolerant quantum computer to be accurate enough. So what we have been doing is we want to, to look for alternatives that work in this uh, quantum computer and also in this uh, tensor network approach. And we have found that uh, there are several problems that are amenable to this uh, manipulation. Well, I showed you before that there are the expectation value, the, the search for expectation value is very well understood, but I'm not going to discuss that. We know that uh, states can be constructed because there is little entanglement. We, we have prescriptions to do it other in tensor network approximations or in the quantum computer. So there are, there are ways to construct those states in the, in the quantum computer. But we also have algorithms for doing Fourier transform, interpolation, and solving partial differential equations in this scenario. Uh, if you want more details, uh, I put out last year a, a paper in the archive that describes this in more detail. So I'm going to give you a sketch of how this works. So for instance, we can start with Fourier analysis. So you take a, a function and you want to do the Fourier transform. In, if you do the FFT of this function where you have discretized the space and you have assigned integers to each position and you, you do the uh, discrete Fourier transform, you get something in MATLAB that looks like this. So it's a Fourier transform of the Gaussian. It's a very concentrated Gaussian in frequency space. Now, um, essentially you have these discrete sums that are implemented very efficiently in the, in the in the classical computer, but we still, they, they have a cost that is uh, linear with the size of the vector. So if you have uh, a problem with um, I don't know, 1,000 points, 
is going to cost you at least of the order of 1,000 operations to do the discrete Fourier transform. We know that if you have this, this function in a quantum computer, we can make a Fourier transform of this function in the same quantum computer. This algorithm is, is known as the discrete, uh, uh, the quantum Fourier transform. And it's a very simple recipe. It wa is the one that uh, is, is underlies the algorithms of, of factorization, factoring. And it's, it's composed of local operations and interactions between pairs of qubits, rotations, uh, conditional rotations between pairs of qubits. Now, the size of this uh, transformation is uh, very small. It's algebraic in the number of uh, bits. So that means that it's exponentially faster than the uh, discrete Fourier transform that we can do in a, qu quantum in a classical computer. Moreover, when we apply this quantum Fourier transform for the type of wave functions I showed you before, we found that the amount of entanglement doesn't increase. So if you were lucky and your wave function had a good tensor network representation, it still has a good tensor network representation, even at the end, it becomes even better because it's very concentrated. So you have that uh, you can do Fourier analysis in a quantum computer using quantum operations, or you can implement these operations using tensors and you still have a good efficient algorithm in a classical computer. Actually, if you do this in a uh, good way with C++ and so on, this algorithm is going to be faster than a fast Fourier transform for the function that we are working with. So now we, when you, once you have Fourier uh, analysis, you th th it opens a door to many algorithms that uh, people use in uh, numerical analysis and in other contexts. I'm going to show you a very stupid application that shows an exponential advantage compared to a classical uh, um, world. You know, Nike's uh, Shannon theorem uh, tells you that if you have a function, uh, you can uh, sample it with a number of points that depends on the bandwidth of that function. Essentially, that's what people uh, use to develop CDs. You have uh, sound has the maximum function that we, uh, frequency that we can hear. It's around 20 kilohertz for an average human uh, ear. If you sample an uh, ordinary sound with a frequency of 44 kilohertz, you can reconstruct it uh, accurately. Now, how this works? Well, you 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 have a representation that has less points than the, that what we want to uh, uh, to reconstruct, but you can use a Fourier transform from those function from those points to reconstruct a, a, a function as smooth as, as you want. So essentially, you would start with a, uh, in this case, it's a Gaussian. Gaussians can be sampled with three to five points, as you know. Uh, you can you have a, in this case a discretization of a function with five qubits. Five qubits are used to encode this this Gaussian, and this will be the Fourier transform of that function. But uh, I want to have a more accurate representation, which is more smooth. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the Fourier transform, sorry, of this one. I want to have a, a smoother representation with more points. In this case, it's uh, ten, 2 to the 10 points, 10 qubits. How we do it is I take this Fourier transform and I, I add zeros to the end of it. And I extend it in Fourier space. And the, to, to extend it in Fourier space simply, uh, simply means adding qubits that have no information. I add zeros to the Fourier transform of, of my original function. And I undo the Fourier transform. And what I get is something like this. Now, if you look at this procedure, I started with a, a, a sampling with five qubits, well, two to the five points, and go to two to the 10 points through uh, two Fourier transforms, direct and inverse, and adding some qubits. The cost of this is algebraic in the number of qubits we have. So if you want to do the same interpolation by uh, classical means, it would need an exponential num number of, of, of operations based on the, the number of points you are going to. And then the last uh, uh, idea is that if you have Fourier transforms, you can use the Fourier transforms to solve equations. In particular, you can solve partial differential equations. And we've known it uh, in physics for a long time. Um, if you have a, a partial differential equation like this, you can represent it in, uh, in Fourier space in a simpler way. So you, the derivatives become multiplication by uh, momentum operators, by frequencies. Um, multiplication is much simpler than just uh, taking derivatives. So the way we, we can solve um, differential equations formally is that I can take a Fourier transform of a function I want uh, to evolve in time, and I can multiply it by exponential of numbers. These are the exponential of these differential operators in Fourier space. These are just numbers times the time of evolution times the inverse Fourier transform. And this is a, is 
it's, um, it's, not, it's a spectral method for solving the, the, the evolution with differential operators. It's been known for a long time in optics. It's the basis of a split step methods. It's used also in quantum mechanics to study scattering of particles or evolution of condensate. And what we can do here is we can do this in a quantum computer. A Fourier transformer can be done in a quantum computer. If your differential operator is up to second order, this exponential can also be done efficiently in a quantum computer with algebra uh, resources. And the inverse Fourier transformer can also be done. And if you don't want to do it in a quantum computer and your function is smooth and uh, bandwidth limited, you can do also this with a tensor network representation of your quantum state. So that would be uh, the way we have uh, obtained this uh, solution of a Fokker-Planck equation uh, in particular. So the message of this talk, uh, which, which covered a lot of uh, ideas, is that we can do sophisticated mathematical cal calculations in quantum computers. And these calculations may have applications in many different uh, uh, fields of physics, science, chemistry, or anywhere. Now, uh, there is a lot of room for uh, understanding how these calculations can be done efficiently in a quantum computer. But there is the hope that many of those problems they have efficient representations in those computers. Just think about it. Uh, uh, not many qubits are required for solving interesting problems. 33 qubits, 32 qubits, no, 33 qubits allows you to do a discretization of a three-dimensional volume with 2,000 points per side. That's a huge mess that can be uh, mesh, mesh, not mess, uh, that can be used to, uh, to solve accurately many problems. And, uh, and that's a number of qubits that is already available in the lab. And if you are lucky, and as I, as I told you, your problems doesn't have a lot of turbulence and you have uh, uh, bandwidth-limited functions, sometimes those problems can even be brought into tensor network representations and, and, and be done efficiently with very simple algorithms which you can even write in Python. I left out many methods based on finite differences, nonlinear Schrodinger equations, and applications, and those are described in the, in the manuscript I mentioned before. And I would like to close a little bit with some advertising. So I'm the coordinator of the quantum technologies uh, platform of CSIC. It's an effort that CSIC has uh, done in the last years to bring together a community of researchers interested in quantum technologies. Includes quantum computing, but also quantum sensing, quantum communication, and other quantum devices. And uh, well, the community is very uh, broad, but uh, it's always welcoming new uh, people interested in collaborating and looking for new applications in different areas of science, uh, as you see, it's a very broad spectrum. And uh, well, I want to thank uh, our group in, in, in the Institute of Fundamental Physics. We are the Twinfo Group, Quantum Information Foundation's group. It's been a uh, long journey since uh, Juan Leon founded it in 2005. And now we have a, a very big team of young researchers, and it's probably incomplete uh, transparency. So you're welcome also to interact with all the people in our group. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting presentation. So now we have time for questions or for any comment you have. Nothing to say. When you say that you have a more efficient uh, algorithm than uh, FFT, what do you mean? Uh, Is the number of operations you need to do the Fourier transform? Yes. It's smaller? Because you are working with tensors. Yeah, yeah but it's smaller in uh, the FTT goes uh, with, co with which power and yours? It goes with, with the size of a vector. It's linear with the size of a yes. vector. And yours? It's uh, log logarithmic. Yes. But that's a, it depends on the function you want to transform. If it already has a good tensor network representation, the Fourier transform, you can implement it using the uh, quantum Fourier transform, which is a collection of local and, and pairwise uh, operators. Yes. And that also has a very efficient tensor representation. And the contraction of those tensors is also efficient. So overall, the cost of that is uh, smaller than the original FFT. Of course, uh, you have to implement it uh, efficiently. Now, is that uh, um, meaning that you should sh sh uh, switch from one algorithm to the other? No, because FFT is uh, problem independent. It is always going to work. But the problem is that FFT is limited by the amount of memory you have to represent your problem. So if you have four gigabytes of data, well, you can do the Fourier transform of four gigabytes of data. But do you want to solve larger problems? But maybe you can use this tensor network representation. You can represent larger problems with an algorithm that is going to take uh, also comparable amount of time or even less. 
So the, the advantage is not only in the speed, but also in the amount of data it can process. So you can represent larger problems, and you can still do the Fourier transform as you know it. In the classical computer. In the classical computer. This is exponential and in the size, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, it requires a logarithm. Exponential gain also in the memory. Yeah. But this is problem dependent, so it's heuristic. It's problem dependent, okay. Yeah. Heuristics. There is no, um, so what I've shown you here is evidence that there are many functions, many problems that are smooth, differentiable, bandwidth limited, which are, uh, for instance, the kind of problems I was solving for my thesis, they were all <coughs> of that nature. They have a very efficient representation uh, with these technologies. Now, if even if you don't have that type of problems, you could encode the problem in a quantum computer. And there you would still get, gain the, uh, um, the exponential advantage from the point of view of asymptotic uh, complexity. And you could do uh, any problem irrespective of the amount of yeah, entanglement. I see, I see. So I, I see. Okay, thank you. More questions or comments? Okay, I, I will ask you a question not about the presentation, uh, but. Uh, uh, are you interested in a, a particular application or, or do you have an application in mind that you think it can be solved in the next few years? Uh, um, that well, the real motivation for uh, developing this type of algorithms is uh, solving stochastic problems, solving focal Planck equations, uh, which are of interest in quantum optics and also in finance. So if you look at the type of Gaussians I was showing you before, which are very stretched, uh, very elongated Gaussians, they can describe the uh, correlated state of light, uh, squeezed light. If you want to solve those problems accurately for large numbers of photons using conventional uh, numerical methods, they fail because the, the Hilbert space grows exponentially, your method fails. Now with this tensor networks approach, you could solve those methods. And now it happens that those same equations that govern the creation of that type of correlated light in Gaussian environments can also describe the evolution of financial assets in the bank. So this is a very useful transfer of technology from one domain to other because the math problems are mathematically identical. Uh, and if I understood well, you uh, although you didn't present it in, in here, you are also working in 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 the hardware uh, mm -hmm. part. What exactly? Uh, well, we, we, we now have a problem that people are not discussing a lot, which is the speed of operations in quantum computers. And that's the main limitation we have together with the decoherence. Decoherence is not going to improve a lot unless we have a breakthrough in, in the fabrication and environment. So uh, another way of uh, improving the current hardware is to make things faster. And we have already uh, ideas. When I was do my doing my postdoc in Munich, we had protocols for doing ultra-fast gates for trapped ions that people are not really catching up and now starting to, to try to do. And also with Eric Torrontegui, we are developing new, new control techniques for uh, controlling superconducting qubits and making them run faster and also with uh, better stability. So that's another line of research uh, in, our, in our group. Uh, yes, a curiosity. When you talk about uh, applications in finance, what do you mean exactly? If these applications are related to predictive power, y impact uh, what, yeah. what impacts do you think this, uh, <laughs> this um, power in your hands will well have there on, is the market, on the economy? No, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to get rich out of this, if that's what you are asking. But there are many interesting mathematical problems that appear in finance, which are related to the study of risk. So in finance, you have very standard probability distributions. People know how to build them. They know how to describe the parameters. Sometimes those parameters are related to uncertainties uh, of information they get from the market, like what volatility and things like that. And they want to do a lot of simulations where they create these probability distributions and they understand how they evolve in time and they make, make predictions about things. One context where this is required, for instance, is where when bank, they want to compute the total amount of risk they have. They have to do these calculations at a massive scale. Uh, involving probabilities for all the assets or all the companies or everything that they can have. There are very precise algorithms for doing that. Sometimes regulatory uh, organizations demand certain applications. And it's interesting to know whether those techniques that people, uh, well, the, the organizations demand from the bank can be implemented with alternative methods. Um, is it going to be faster? Is it going to be more accurate? 
that's interesting in itself. Uh, it may lead to different workflows for banks, may lead to applications of quantum computers, and a way of justifying the technology in the near term, which is very, very much uh, required. But it also may lead to developments in the classical uh, domain of algorithms for dis describing those problems. So it's a little bit of everything. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, you mentioned that one of your applications is uh, to use uh, this encoding in order to solve uh, partial differential e equations uh, with uh, large meshes. Mm -hmm. uh, and one application that comes to my mind that consumes huge uh, amounts of uh, computational power is uh, meteorological uh, models. Uh, what? Meteorological models. Oh, yeah, okay. Have you considered? Well, I don't know the equations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably highly nonlinear. So we still are. They are. <coughs> yeah, I don't know. They are chaotic. So In principle, we can do nonlinear equations with this technique. You have to double the register to have two copies of the function. Uh, but we haven't worked much on that. The, the type of equations we have been studying is Fokker flanks and Schrodinger equations, which have applications in these places, optics and everywhere. But yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, maybe. But also, for instance, there are much simpler problems, probably in, in the domain of uh, seismology, where you can model uh, propagation of sound waves in material or, or yeah, material science in general. That would be another domain. No, there are no more questions. Okay, then we thank uh, Juanjo again. We have a small present to you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> cool.